Aristotle's famous book about moral philosophy, the Nicomachean Ethics, is well known for its treatment of many topics we've discussed so far. Happiness, moral virtue, intellectual virtue, choice, moral responsibility, and many other things. Toward the end of that book, Aristotle devotes a long discussion to something that might seem strange in a discussion of morality, namely, friendship. To Aristotle, this, though, is not strange at all, since for him, friendship has much to do with ethics. As we've seen, Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas both argue that the ultimate goal of human life is happiness. And so the first observation we can make for the importance of friendship is just how necessary it is for happiness. As Aristotle puts it, quote, no one would choose to live without friends, even if he had all other goods. Rich men and those who hold office and power are, above all, regarded as requiring friends. For what good would their prosperity do them if it did not provide them with the opportunity for good works? And the best works done and those which deserve the highest praise are those that are done to one's friends. End of quote. Friendship, moreover, is essential in the proper functioning of political life. And one of the most important social goals of any king or government is to facilitate a kind of friendship among the people. Friendship is, though, not to be confused with justice. And as Aristotle wisely observes, quote, When people are friends, they have no need of justice. But when they are just, they need friendship in addition. In other words, friendship is in some way higher and nobler than justice, and the bond between friends is thought to be stronger than those between fellow citizens. Aristotle is never completely clear as to whether friendship is a virtue. It is, of course, not the same thing as friendliness, which, if we remember, is the moral virtue between the extremes of grouchiness and obsequiousness. At the beginning of his discussion of friendship, Aristotle merely says that it's some sort of excellence or virtue, or that it involves virtue. This statement may be unpacked as we look a little further into his discussion. Perhaps the most central aspect of his teaching on friendship is Aristotle's claim that friendship may be divided into three types, which are based upon what he observes as, quote, the three things worthy of affection. These are, First, the good, second, the pleasant, and third, the useful. We have affection for others, in other words, because of their goodness, the degree to which they give us pleasure, and their usefulness to us. And so friendship, in turn, is based upon these three, utility, pleasure, and finally, virtue. Friendships that are based on utility and pleasure are, in many ways, lower forms of friendship. This doesn't mean that such friendships are bad or morally wrong. In many ways, they are the most common, and we might even say that a well-functioning society should abound in such friendships. Nevertheless, they are unquestionably superficial. As Aristotle says, quote, We see that when the useful is the basis of affection— Men love because of the good they get out of it, and when pleasure is the basis, for the pleasure they get out of it. In other words, the friend is not loved because he is a friend, but because he is pleasant or useful. Thus, these two kinds are only friendship incidentally, since the object of affection is not loved for being the kind of person he is, but for providing some good or pleasure. Consequently, such friendships are easily dissolved when the partners do not remain unchanged. The affection ceases as soon as one partner is no longer pleasant or useful to the other. So the classic example of a useful friendship would be the relationship one has with a business partner or someone with whom we engage in some kind of commercial exchange. The woman that cuts your hair, for instance, might be a good example. While she's cutting your hair, you may exchange information about your lives, joke around, maybe even share some personal information. 
But at the end of the day, you wouldn't be friends with that person if not for the commercial transaction in which you're engaging. As for examples of friendships based on pleasure, Aristotle has in mind primarily the people in our lives we enjoy for their appearance, their wit, their sense of humor, or other such personality traits that we enjoy. As he speculates, quote, friendship of young people seems to be based on pleasure, for their lives are guided by emotion, and they pursue most intensely what they find pleasant and what the moment brings. As they advance in years, different things become pleasant for them. Hence, they become friends quickly, and just as quickly cease to be friends. For as other things become pleasant, the friendship too changes, and the pleasure of a young man changes quickly. Also, young people are prone to fall in love, since the greater part of falling in love is a matter of emotion and based on pleasure. That's why they form a friendship and give it up again so quickly that the change often takes place within the same day. End of quote. These observations explain why Aristotle refers to friendships based on virtue as true friendships. Rather than the friendship being based on what we can get out of it, true friendships are based upon the virtue or excellence of the friend. We love that friend, in other words, not because of what they do for us, but because of who they are. That is to say, an excellent human being. To be sure, true friendships may also have an element of pleasure or utility. Perhaps this is how the friendships even begin. But as true friendships, they are no longer based on pleasure or utility, and they will endure even if the pleasure we derive from them wanes, or if the friendship ceases to be useful. So it turns out that friendship has a great deal to do with morality. Because of the fact that true friendship is based on virtue, it follows that one must be virtuous in order to have true friendships. True friendships are rare, therefore, for the very same reason that virtue itself is rare. As Aristotle says, quote, Such friendships are, of course, rare, since such men are few. Moreover, time and familiarity are required. One cannot extend friendship or be a friend of another person until each partner has impressed the other that he is worthy of affection and until each has won the other's confidence. Those who are quick to show signs of friendship to one another are not really friends, though they wish to be. They are not true friends unless they are worthy of affection and know this to be so. The wish to be friends can come about quickly, but friendship cannot. End of quote. But not only is it true that virtue is necessary for friendship, it is also true that friendship is necessary for virtue. And this is where things get really interesting. Human beings need friendship in order to be good. Virtue, it seems, is not something that we acquire in a vacuum. Obviously, we need good parents and a good upbringing, and it helps to have the virtues reinforced by good laws and cultural mores. But friends play an equally important role. Friends that love us because we're virtuous, and whom we love for their virtue, call us to reach a higher standard of human excellence. We want to be good for them, and they want to be good for us. In an analogous way to the way in which people grow together in knowledge, in an important sense, my own virtue is something in which my true friends share, and I share in their virtue. Unlike the pleasures of the five senses, then, Virtue is truly a common good, and its commonality is something that primarily is common among friends. This appears to be the basis underlying Aristotle's often quoted remark that a true friend may be described as another self. Hopefully we can see why Aristotle's discussion of friendship is so well known and highly regarded even by people who don't otherwise subscribe to an Aristotelian or Thomistic philosophical worldview. Not only does he provide us with a compelling theory of friendship that is fully integrated into his broader moral theory, he also provides us with some very helpful practical advice once that theory is set forth. Three examples of this advice are worth noting. 
First, Aristotle considers the question of when friendships have come to an end and when they should be dissolved. As we've already seen, there's nothing strange about this happening with friendships of utility and pleasure. When these friends cease to be useful or pleasant, the friendship, we might say, goes away naturally. What's harder is when there's no clear understanding or agreement as to what the friendship is actually based on. Hard feelings naturally arise, for example, when one person believes a friendship is based solely on pleasure, whereas the other believes that it's based upon goodness. So we must take great care to interpret our friendships correctly and not to give in to wishful thinking. As Aristotle puts it, quote, when a person has erroneously assumed that the affection he got was for his character, though nothing in his friend's conduct suggested anything of the sort, he has only himself to blame. But when he has been deceived by his friend's pretense, he has every right to complain against the deceiver. End of quote. Also worth considering, given Aristotle's teaching, is how many friends one should have. How many friends should we have? If friendship is, like virtue, a kind of unqualified good, would it be right to say that we should just have as many friendships as possible? Aristotle's answer to this is no. Certainly, when it comes to useful and pleasant friendships, it's easy to imagine one having too many. As he puts it, quote, to accommodate many people in return for what they have done to us is troublesome, and life is not long enough to do that. And further, quote, to give us pleasure, a few friends are sufficient, just as it takes little to give food the right amount of sweetness. Even when it comes to virtuous friendships, though, we should recognize that there are natural limits. The amount of time and effort and energy that it takes to invest in a friend of this sort just means that we cannot have too many of them. This is why, says Aristotle, that, quote, those who have many friends and are on familiar terms with any chance acquaintance are thought to be friends to none. Though there's no magic number, therefore, our circle of virtuous friendships should be rather small. Finally, Aristotle recommends that friends should live together, or at least that true friendships are difficult to sustain unless there is physical proximity. To be sure, Aristotle's point here may be mitigated somewhat by modern advances in communication, of which he could have scarcely imagined. But physical proximity would likely remain for him a necessary condition for friendships that last. As he states, quote, only by living together can the perception of a friend's existence be activated. And whatever his existence means to each partner individually, or whatever is the purpose that makes his life desirable, he wishes to pursue it together with his friends. That is why some friends drink together or play dice together, while others go in for sports together and hunt together, or join in the study of philosophy. End of quote. In short, true friendship is a shared life. And because, unlike angels or gods, we are physical beings subject to the constraints of time and space, our friendships too require time spent together and physical proximity. To conclude, let us remember that Aristotle's decision to devote such a large portion of his Nicomachean ethics to a discussion of friendship stems from his conviction that morality is ultimately oriented to a goal beyond itself, namely happiness. Those things that are most important for happiness, therefore, such as virtue and friendship, would naturally deserve the most extensive discussion. In the final lecture of this course, we will take a closer look at Aristotle's and St. Thomas Aquinas's understanding of happiness itself. What exactly is it? What does it consist in? And how ultimately do we attain it?